We want to rewind the clock back about 2,000 years to that Sunday morning when Jesus had died about 36 hours earlier. His disciples were now in a bit of a state of disarray. They didn't quite know what was going on because they'd spent the last three years of their life following Jesus. They'd spent the last three years going where he told them to go, doing what he told them to do, just listening to his teachings, and, and no doubt they were like in awe of some of his teachings. In fact, they would say, hey, he, he teaches with an authority like we've never seen before. They saw the miraculous take place in front of their own eyes and, and would have just been like, what is going on? They lived with him, they ate with him, they stayed, you know, stayed with him that whole time. They often walked away from their families and, and, and their careers and what they were doing in order to follow him, moving away from their friends and everything they'd known. And then in the last sort of 48 hours, everything changed because they really did believe that Jesus was the Christ, that he was the Messiah. He was the one who was going to come and free them from oppression. He was the one who was going to come and, and, and remove the bondage. He was the one who's going to take them out of the Roman Empire and give them a sense of freedom. And in fact, they were even more excited because just a few days prior to Jesus' death, right, Jesus came into town on the donkey and the crowds were around and they were putting the palm branches down as Jesus came into town. And, and this was powerful because they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. So the, the crowd said there was, hey, this is a moment of religious significance. But it was also political because they referred to Jesus then as being the king. And at that point, right, his disciples and, and all of his wider crowd of followers must have just been walking with their shoulders a little higher, like, hey, he's the one who's going to be large and in charge, and, and we're, we're his backup team. So, so we're going to have the respect, we're going to have the right houses, we're going to be the ones that have got the influence. Man, what a place to be. And so I think at this point, they would have been even more excited about what was taking place, even more sure of what was to come. But then they saw Jesus get arrested, and they probably said, they're going, okay, now it's time, now it's time, what's going to happen, Jesus? And then they see, see, they see Jesus go before the courts, and Jesus refusing to testify. They're going, okay, come on, Jesus, well, when's that moment going to happen? When are you going to, when are you going to come out? When are you going to do it? When's it going to happen? And then all of a sudden, <laughs> they see Jesus being beaten. They see him carrying his cross. They see him get nailed to it. Or maybe they only heard stories because by this stage, man, they're running for their own lives. They see Jesus die. And at that point, man, there must have been a lot of frustration, a lot of angst, a lot of anger, a lot of confusion. Come on, have any of you ever spent years pursuing something, trying to make something happen, all for it just to blow up, to not work out? I was trying to think of an example where, where I've experienced this, and, and, and honestly, I couldn't, so I have to change the story. But I, I mean, a lot of us have, have been to university, and I remember at university, I had to study for four years, and um, the, the first year in particular were really hard. The last year was a little bit easier. I had to do six papers instead of eight, and I did have a little daughter then, so I had to work a little bit harder on, on the home front. But I, I still remember the, the day that I was finished my very last exam. It was a Māori land law paper, and when I finished the exam, the person said, hey, time's up, and I just got the biggest smile on my face, and a sense of relief was like, ha, I'm finally there, I'm finally at the end of this thing. And I just imagine what would have happened after I walked out of that, if someone came and tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, Clint, um, we've seen all the work you've put in over the last four years, we really appreciate the payment of your fees, that's really helped us, but by the way, we don't give out degrees anymore, so all that work counts for nothing. I was like, imagine how angry I'd be. Imagine how disappointed. Oh, I'd probably want to break something. I'd probably want to hurt someone. I'd be like absolutely fuming because all of that time, all of that effort, all of that work, all of that money I'd put into something would be worth absolutely nothing. And I, I just imagine that's what these disciples must have felt like. The, the wider group of people who had been following Jesus, they would have been at this point and just been beside themselves. Like, man, we've spent three years, three and a half years doing this thing. And it's amounted to Jesus dying. And the reason that they would have been feeling like that is, is because they're just like you, they're just like me. And they've experienced death. They've seen 
people die. I've had those close to them die, those in their neighborhoods pass away. And they knew what happened when someone died, right? That dead people stay dead. And so when Jesus died, all of a sudden they're like, he can't be our king. He can't be who he said he was. And there'd be a sense of shame and embarrassment for them because they're like, but, but we really believe we followed him with everything we've got. We, we put all our eggs in that basket. Basket's blown up. Eggs are wasted. Oh, how am I going to go home? What's my family going to say? What are my friends going to say? And in the midst of it too, there would have been a, a whole lot of fear because they saw what had happened to Jesus. They said, hey, if that happened to Jesus, who's next in line? Uh, us, right? And we don't want to experience that. Like none of the disciples would have been sitting there that day and going, okay, what's in our to-do list, our top of it, get crucified like Jesus, please? But like no one wanted that. And so, so here they are in this place of just like probably utter brokenness, utter confusion, not knowing what to do next. And then some of the women, they go down to the tomb and they discover that the tomb is empty. And they realize that, hang on a minute, Jesus has been resurrected. And then they're reminded of what Jesus had said. And Jesus had told them, hey, I'm going to die and three days later I'm going to rise again. But when you hear that stuff, right, Jesus was teaching so much, they would have been like, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Like, how, that doesn't happen. We've never ever seen that. We haven't got a framework for that. We don't understand it. And if you're here and, and you're trying to figure out faith or you're like, man, maybe someone brought you along to church today because it's Easter, and, and you're like, yeah, yeah, there's something about Christian values. Yeah, there's something about Christian um, principles that I like. But, but that whole resurrection thing, I just can't get my head around that. Like, it, it doesn't make sense. I don't know if I can believe in this faith because of that resurrection thing. Can I say you're in really good company? Because even though Jesus had told his disciples and his followers that's what he was going to do, none of them believed it. Because at the core of the Christian message is, is just the rea this reality that nobody expected, nobody. Nobody expected there to be nobody in the tomb. Not even his closest followers, not even those that had spent all that time with them expected there to be nobody when they went and looked at the tomb. The ladies went to the tomb because they knew that two guys had gone and, and, and wrapped Jesus up and prepared him for burial. And, and women just do what women do when they hear a guy's done a job. They think a body needs to be done properly, so they went to check on it. And, and, and so the woman went and, and they checked and they discovered that there's nobody. And, and, and so the woman go back and then they, they find the men. And then they go back and say, guys... <laughs> Exciting news. We've got to tell you something. Jesus is alive. There's no body in the tomb. And, and Luke then records it, and Luke tells us. And, and, and do you know what Luke says that the men's reaction was when they heard this from the woman? He said the men's reaction was that the woman was speaking utter nonsense. The woman come back. This is what's happened. Nah, it's a nonsense, utter nonsense. Can't be true. And I love that that's recorded for us. Well, what I, what I love, though, is, is what happens next, because we're told that the disciples then want to go and see for themselves. We can't trust these ladies. Let's go check this out for ourselves. And I love what John does here, because John does what every single one of us guys would do. And oh, I don't know about ladies, I can't speak on your behalf, but I know for us guys, this is, this is what, you, what you'll do, this is what I'll do. He, he, he talks about how him and Peter run back to the tomb. And that's cool. But when John's writing this account, and I don't think he expected this account probably to be around for 2,000 years and for it to be as well known as what it is, but he probably hoped that maybe one day his kids would read it and maybe one day Peter's kids would read it and a few others. And so John just puts in this detail that Peter and I ran back to the tomb. And this is what he does, guys, and you'll appreciate this. He says, and I won the race. I was the first one there. And every other guy would be like, yeah, yeah, I'd put that down too. Peter conveniently would never record that. But John's... I'm not letting anyone forget. We had a race and I won it that day. So good. And then they get, they get to the tomb and then they discover too that Jesus has risen, that his body isn't there, that the tomb is empty, that Jesus really is who he says he is, that Jesus can do what he says he's going to do because what Jesus' resurrection did is, is his resurrection, it um, authenticated and it substantiated Jesus' claims. When they saw that Jesus was resurrected, they're like, man, 
This authenticates the fact that he really is the Son of God. This substantiates the reality that he can forgive us of our sin. He can offer us new life. He can do all that he said he could do. And again, if, if you're here and you're like, ah, oh, the, you know, the, the whole, I, I kind of believe this, but oh, can I get there? Can I just read what a, a man called John Dominic Crossan, he, he wrote a, a book called Jesus, a Revolutionary Biography. And the interesting part about this is he, he's not a Christian. And I think that gives so much weight to these words because these are what you'd expect someone of faith to say. But, but this guy who, who studied Jesus' life, who's written all about it, actually isn't a follower, isn't a Christian. He says this. He says, Jesus' death by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate is as sure as anything historical can ever be. For if no follower of Jesus had written anything, and what we have in the Scriptures, we've got four accounts of Jesus' life from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All of them were followers of Jesus. John, he was one of the disciples. Luke, um, not Luke, Matthew, he was one of the disciples. Mark really got most of his account from Peter, who was, um, you know, the disciple who right there as an eyewitness. Luke, he, he realized, man, so much was going on that he decided he too had to write an orderly account just to substantiate and make sure that all the facts were right. And Luke went and spoke to all the eyewitnesses, and he wrote an account of Jesus' life. And, and, and what, what John Cross is saying here is that, that even if there was nothing written, even if those four people or other Christian authors had written nothing for 100 years after his crucifixion, and what makes those four accounts so special is they weren't written 100 years after his crucifixion. No, they were written sort of fairly soon after because at that point, John realized, oh, I've got to write something down because this is unbelievable. Uh, Matthew's saying, well, I can't believe what's taking place. I've got to write this down. Um, so it all happened a lot sooner than that. But he says, even if, if they hadn't written anything, we would still know about Jesus from two other authors who are not Jesus supporters. Their names are um, Flavius Josephus and Cornelius, um, how do you say that, Tacitus. And, and so he, this guy who's not a Christian says, hey, the, the evidence that Jesus died, it's, it can't be faulted. Yet what, what happened that day, or the day of the resurrection, was something so powerful, something so transformative. And I think what it does is it points to what I believe Easter represents more than anything else. And that's hope. That's hope. Because that morning, when Jesus' disciples, when his followers woke up, there really was a sense of hopelessness. There was impending doom. What's going on here? We've wasted all this time. How embarrassing. We've walked away from all we know. Now we've probably got a target on our back. And what have we got to show for it? Absolutely nothing. But by the end of that day, that group of people were radically transformed. By the end of that day, those same people who had saw Jesus crucified had the boldness, had the conviction to stand up in front of crowds and say, hey, 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 well, you, you heard about Jesus, right? We knew him. Hey, we saw him. We saw him get killed. Peter even had the audacity to say to crowds, hey, hey, you guys, you're the ones who killed him. You're the ones who took him out. Yeah, so remember that day? When everyone was chanting, you got to save a criminal. And you always said, we want Barabbas, we want Barabbas. And Jesus got sent. You guys killed him. But guess what? <laughs> He's alive. We've seen him. He is who he says. Yes, he He's the son of God. And if you, like Brett said earlier, want your name written in that book of glory, all you've got to do is trust him. And your name can be written in that book of glory too. And just a little, where we go? If, if you've never had your name written in that book of glory, if you've never become a follower of Jesus at the end of our little time today, we're going to give you an opportunity to say, hey, yeah, I want my name written in that book of glory. I want to be a follower of Jesus. So, so if that's you, if God's speaking to you, hey, we're going to give you that opportunity before we leave today. But, but Peter was standing out there. These same people who, who were over here, unafraid, hopeless, were now so full of hope that they couldn't help but share what they knew. They couldn't help but share what that scene. It was so transformative, the resurrected Jesus. And I think what Easter means for you and what Easter can mean for me is just, just a sense of hope, that we can have hope. Because at, at the core of it is this, and understand this. If God can take 
a blood-stained cross and transform that into an empty tomb? Is there anything he can't do? If, if God can take that blood-stained cross, that, that, that um, element of torture, didn't what a cross represented at this time? It was an instrument of torture. Like, and imagine the minds of people when they're like, okay, guys, let's get together. We, we need to make a decision on how we're going to execute people. Um, what, what could we do? Um, cut the head off. Oh, yeah, we could do that. Um, maybe we could put a noose around the neck, hang them. Yes, put it on the board. How about this, guys? <laughs> how about we get two pieces of wood and we form them into a cross? And then what we do is we put nails through someone's hands and nails through someone's feet and let them die like that. Oh, that's novel. Yeah, but, but what we'll do is we'll lift them up in the air so, 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 so they're there. And then what we'll do is we'll put it out in public so everyone can see it because that will remind people to fall in line. That'll remind people that we're in control. It'll act as a deterrent to any behavior that we don't want. Why don't we go with that? And so Jesus takes this, this picture of, of a cross, this, this thing that represents torture, this thing that would have elicited thoughts of, of, of stuff like pain, of suffering, of oppression. And, and God takes a bloodstained cross and then he transforms it into an empty tomb. Come on, if God can do that, what can't he do? There's no situation that's too far out of his reach. There's no circumstances that he, he can't turn around. There's no current reality that we can find ourselves in that God can't get involved in and work together for our good. If he can do that, blood-stained cross to an empty tomb, come on. Can we have hope in any situation? Can we have hope that no matter how dark and how difficult that valley is, man, there's something better to come? That's what the resurrection did. Luke Johnson, a New Testament scholar, he says that there's some sort of powerful transformative experience is required to generate the sort of movement the earliest Christianity was. That there's something so powerful must have happened, something so transformative to take these group of followers that were sitting here being hopeless to now so full of hope, so bold that they'll go out and say what, what they'd experienced, say what they'd seen, say what had taken place. What was so powerful about the hope that these group of followers had was that they really were willing to die in order to share what they'd experienced. See, all of the disciples, Jesus, you know, he's not having 12 disciples. Judas died not long after Jesus felt so guilty from betraying him. So there's 11 left. Of those 11 disciples, 10 of them, church history would tell us, 10 of them were killed for their faith. 10 of them lost their lives, not because they were sick, not because of a tragic accident, but because they wouldn't stop talking about what had taken place. History tells us that Peter wasn't simply crucified, but he was asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel that he could die in the same way as his Savior. Imagine the hope you've got to have in what's to come to keep sharing that message, to, to keep talking about it, to keep loving the people that are around you when you're facing that sort of persecution. There's got to be an incredible amount of hope. And so what I want to, what I want to suggest is, is what I think Easter does better than almost anything else. And this is, this is so important. In particular, if you're a Christ follower, here you've got to understand this. If you're not a Christ follower, maybe this, this will help you lean in a little bit more to, to understanding what God has done for us. But what we've got to do is we've got to embrace the tension. Easter helps us see this tension. Because what Easter does on one side, right, you've got this cross, the, the sadistic, this evil, this awful way of killing people, of, of maintaining control. This way, we're going to torture you to, to such a degree that it's going to be public. Like, ah, it's just awful, right? It's just got this, like, ah, this brokenness. And the tension really is the brokenness of what we see and holding that intention with the beauty of what's to come. Because while we've got the picture of the cross and all the brokenness that it represents, on this side, we've got a picture of what can be. 
And we see that in the resurrection of Jesus because that shows us that Jesus has, in fact, defeated death. And what, what, what Paul tells us later is, he, he says it this way, he says that, hey, no eye can see, no ear has heard, no mind can imagine what God has in store for us with the new heavens and with the new earth. That there is going to be this place one day where there is no pain, where there is no suffering, where things are just going to be beautiful and things are going to be perfect. And so what Easter does is it puts this picture of, of the brokenness as to how of, of the way of the world and, and in the beauty of what's to come. And again, we don't have to, to be super onto it to, to realize how broken the world is, right? Like all we have to do is look at what's going on. Read the newspapers. Just this, this week, you know, like a, a few kilometers as the bird flies from here, there was a four-year-old and a five-year-old. They were living in a situation where they were getting so beaten that the authorities had to take the kids off their parents. Just a few kilometers in this direction that this is going on. The very people that were there to look after and to love on these kids, were beating and abusing and hurting them. That's evil. It's broken. We look further afield, right? And you look at what's going on in Gaza, and you see the stats and the numbers of people that are dying needlessly, of the huge percentage of those that are young people. Bombs are coming down. Young people are losing their lives. Young people that you know, haven't even got to an age where they can have a sense of, of, of hatred of this people, hatred of that people just being blown up and killed by other people. There's this war still going on in Ukraine that you know, so many people have been displaced, so many people are losing their lives, so many people's incomes gone, people not knowing you know, where, where their food's going to come from now. And, and it was real big in the newspaper for a while, but you know, where Western media understands that there's only so much we can take and then they just sort of stop showing us the reality of what's still going on, but if you go and look for it, you can find out there's still some man horrific stuff going on. You, you read, read the stats of the amount of people in, in New Zealand where, where domestic violence and, and, and pain and suffering is part of their story. It's just horrific. We, we cannot doubt that, man, there's a brokenness to this world. And while we can look at all that stuff and think, oh, well, we're good, well, what we know, sort of when we just take a moment to reflect on ourselves for a moment is, that divide between good and evil runs right through even our hearts, doesn't it? Because because all of us, all of us, while we might not have done stuff to the same degree as other people, man, all of us have done something that's caused someone else pain. All of us have taken something probably that doesn't belong to us. All of us have got that leaning, like if I just lie about this, if I do this, if I bring that person down, I can go up because that evil lurks within us. But then, as I said before, there's, there's the beauty. And sometimes in life, we're lucky enough to catch glimpses of that beauty, right? Like maybe you've been to, to, to a beautiful place and you've sat there and maybe you've climbed a mountain or you've sat on a beach and you've watched the sunrise and you see the beauty of that and just think, wow. Or maybe you've been out in nature and you just look at the incredible creation and you're like, wow. Or maybe you've, you've, you've visited a zoo or been on a safari and you've seen just the diversity of animal life and it's like, wow. Or maybe you've sat with a friend or with a group of friends and had a nice long meal together or dinner or just been kicking it out, out back and, and, and you've just been talking and laughing, those deep belly laughs and times just flowing by and it's like, oh. And we've experienced like moments of those beauty and I think what Easter does is it, it reminds us we, we've got to hold these two things in tension. We've got to hold the tension of, man, the brokenness that exists with the beauty of that which is to come. And we, we get glimpses of this and we get glimpses of that. And what can happen so easily is we can go too far in one direction. We can go to this end where, where things are broken and you look at the evil around the world and if you dwell on that and you think about that too much, it can be depressing. It can break you because you can get to the point going, what is the point in life? What is the point in existing when all this is going on? Other people, they can go too far this way, right? They can be down this end and 
You're like, no, 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 God's going to fix everything. God's going to do it. God's going to do it. God's going to do it. You just got to believe it. God's going to do it. And then God doesn't do it. Because, I don't know, my experience in living the Christian life and when I talk to other people, it tends to be that their experience is that sometimes God comes and God does what we can't understand and we can't explain and he does that miracle. And it's like, wow. And he allows us to, to catch the beauty of what he can do. But come on, all of us have prayed for people and that diagnosis never got turned around. All of us have prayed for that situation and it never changed. All of us have prayed for that relationship with that friend where things were going bad. And we're like, come on, God, can you please restore this? And it, it blew up. And I think what, what Easter does is it, it, it positions us and it helps us because of this hope that we can have to hold these two things in tension. Yes, yes, there's the evil. Yes, there's brokenness. Yes, there's pain. Yes, there's heartache. Yes, there's difficulty in this world. But there's also beauty. There's also what's to come. I love the way the author of Hebrews puts it when he says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. The brokenness and the beauty. For the joy set before him, he endured the brokenness of the cross. And I think the reason so many people walk away from faith or give up on faith is because they, they struggle with this tension and they want to lean this way, they want to lean this way. And, and what we often want to do in life is, is we want things to be black or to be white. But well, I think what Easter reminds us of is this incredible tension that exists in the world in which we live. The brokenness of the world we live in, the evil that's so there. But also the beauty that we're catching glimpses now but we know is to come. The bloodstained cross, the empty tomb, I've got to live with this intention. And, and I, I think that there's no better way to illustrate this than to actually use the image of the cross. See brands around the world, brands spend billions, billions of dollars promoting their brand. I'd hate to know how much money Nike spent over the years making it swish so well known, right? The Coca-Cola brand, the Big M on McDonald's, the Apple brand, they spend so much money establishing this brand. But do you know what is the most well-known symbol in all the world? It's not the Nike Turk, it's not the Apple, Apple. It's not the McDonald's M, it's the cross. It's the cross, it's the most well-known symbol. But what this symbolized initially was that pain, that suffering, the oppression that we talked about before. But when people see the cross now, it, it doesn't symbolize that, does it? You don't wear a cross on your neck like, like so many people do to, to remind people of the brutality way of torture that the crucifixion was. You don't have that cross tattooed on your arm like so many people have got because you want others to be fearful of the Roman Empire. Now we, we wear the cross today and we use the cross to symbolize hope, to symbolize joy, to symbolize love, to symbolize peace. See, and the cross itself is a very strong picture of the broken and the evilness of this world and the hope and the beauty of what's to come. It's, it's so, so powerful, and we need to live with this tension. A lot of the way Paul talks about this, Paul's right into the church at Corinth, and he, he says it this way. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Full of hope. Full of hope. Though outwardly, I'm wasting away the brokenness, the difficulty of this world. Inwardly, come back this way, I'm being renewed day by day, goes back, for our light and momentary troubles. And, and Paul says, our light and momentary troubles. Have you read about Paul's troubles? If, if you read, in one passage, he actually describes all of his, or so, like a series of troubles that he's been through. And he talks about how he's been flogged. He's been whipped 39 times. He's been left for dead. He's been stranded at sea. He's been bitten by snakes. This guy has, has been thrown out of town with nothing, not even the clothes on his back. And he says, <laughs> for our light and momentary troubles, come on, 
the, the, those troubles are way bigger than most of the troubles that you and I have ever faced. Hopefully we'll ever face. He says, hey, for, for my light and momentary troubles, the evil, what does he say? Are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. He brings us down the scent. And then he continues to so we fix our eyes. Not on what is seen, because if all we do is look at what we see, it's evil. It's broken. We see the brokenness of the world. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix my eyes on what is unseen. Not what is temporary, but what is eternal. He, he brings this tension out so beautifully. Yes, we face troubles. Yes, we face difficulties. Yes, it's, it's hard. Yes, it takes a toll on us. But, but it's producing for us an eternal glory that far outweighs it all. He's living in this tension between the brokenness of what is and the beauty of what can come. And that is what I believe is at the center of the Easter story. And that is good news. Because, because listen, listen. We don't ignore the difficulties. We don't ignore the pain. We don't ignore the evil and the brokenness that's in the world. Mark, if you want to come, that'd be cool. We don't ignore all of that stuff. But at the same time, we don't ignore the beauty when we see it. We don't ignore the beautiful and the fullness of it that is to come. And if we're going to hold fast to our faith, if we're really going to understand what living a Christian life's like, we've got to be able to embrace the tension of the brokenness and the beauty. And the brokenness is going to break our hearts and the brokenness is going to mean we go through things and the brokenness is going to break our hearts and the brokenness is, is going to mean times where we're crying and, and, and screaming and angry and frustrated, but the beauty is going to drive us forward because of the hope that we can have. And the cross sits at the center of it all. It really does. And I want, to, I want to tell you, this is, this is what the Scriptures refer to as, as good news, because it's really good. Well, what's, what's amazing is, so oftentimes we get given the Bible, and we think that this, 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 this whole Bible is it's like evenly weighted. But I want to suggest that it's not. I want to suggest that the story of Easter is like 90% of the importance of what's in here. That's why it's told four times, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's why all the New Testament letters refer to it. That's why so much of what's written in the Old Testament alludes to it in a way that even the writers didn't know what they were doing. And I think one of the mistakes we can make as, as, as Christians is we just have Easter as one of another Bible story. Oh, we've got the story of Abraham, we've got the story of Isaac, we've got the story of Samson, we've got the story of David, we've got the story of, keep going, on oh, this Easter. But no, 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 Easter is the story, and it's such good news. You see, the, the, the verse that a lot of people use when, it, when they want to describe Easter is John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him will not die, but have everlasting life. But can I, can I tell you, People stop there, but I think the next part's the best part. Because right after that, Jesus says this. For God did not send his son to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And if the message you've got, or the message you've heard, if Christianity has ever come to you in a way where you feel condemned, can I tell you that you haven't been taught biblical Christianity? And then I've got to apologize because it's probably someone like me from a stage like this or, or Christians like us who have given you news that isn't so good. But the news that Jesus' followers shared, the news that we can get from Easter is good news because Jesus didn't come to condemn you. He came to save you. He comes to help you live in this tension because I honestly think if we're going to live a life, no, no, no matter whether you're a person of faith or you're a person not of faith, you're going to live somewhere in this tension. Because all of us see the brokenness and the evilness of this world. And all of us have got to find a way to keep moving forward. 
And I, I honestly think you've got to have more faith to hold these two things in tension. If you don't believe in Jesus, then if you do. Because Jesus helps us bring this tension together. In a way, if, if you haven't got faith, man, I, I, I don't know how you do it, honestly. But I, I said before, we'll finish up today by doing exactly what Brett talked about and saying, hey, if you want to write your name, if you want to have your name written in the book of glory, all you've got to do is ask God. All you've got to do is say, God, man, I believe Jesus is who you said he is. I believe that he is the Son of God. I believe he lived the perfect life and he died a horrific death, a death that I deserve, but he took on. And say, God, thank you. Thank you for taking my punishment and offering me the life that Jesus deserved. See, how cool is that? This is why it's good news. We get to trade in the death that we deserve because of the evil and the wrong that we've done in order to live and the beauty that Jesus deserved because he did no wrong. How's that bad news? How's that just hurt news? That is good news because we get to trade in all of our wrongdoing. We get to trade in what we deserve and we get offered something so much better. And so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to ask you if you want to pray, to pray a little prayer with me. If you're here, can I ask, and you're a Christian, can I ask you a favor? Can you pray this prayer with me? Because I don't want people that are praying this prayer for the first time or maybe the first time in a long time to be the only person in the room praying because then I'd feel real awkward. So if, if you're a Christian, you just pray this with me. And, and if you're here and you say, man, I want my name written in that book of glory like Brett spoke about. If you say, man, I, I, I want to follow Jesus. I, I do believe that he is the son of God. I do believe that he has died so that I may receive life. I want you to pray this prayer. So let me just ask you, I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes. The only reason I ask you to do this is primarily because I want this to be an opportunity where there's no distractions. Because I, I believe with all my heart that God's speaking to some people right now. You know who you are. He's saying, hey, this is your moment. This is your chance. So maybe you've never prayed this prayer, but God's saying to you right now, how I want you to pray it. Maybe you prayed this a long time ago and life happened. Things got busy. You just never really followed him. Man, this can be that, that turning point where you say, no, 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 I want Christ to be central in my life. I want you to pray this prayer. So if that's you, or you're already a Christian, why don't you pray this with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your son to die for me. I believe Jesus is the son of God. And today, I choose to follow him as best I can from this day forward. Make me new. Fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, and if you did, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or for the first time in a long time, we've got a, a little Bible we'd love to put in your hands. There's a card with it to help you take some just initial first steps because we really do believe with all of our heart that that's the best decision that you could ever, ever make. And we really want to get alongside you and support you and help you outwork that decision.